Find your future by exploring your world. The Massachusetts School of Law challenges their students to explore the important issues of our time, learning from experts in fields like politics, sports, and business law. From firsthand accounts and dramatic reenactments, in-depth conversations with society's leaders, from historians to lawyers, from high-tech professionals to environmental experts, the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover presents MSLaw.edu. Welcome to MS Law Presents, a remote animal law day. I am Michael L. Coyne, the Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law in Andover. For decades now, we have been a leader in animal law, education, and advocacy. Today's program is the 2020-2021 edition of our annual Animal Law Day held each year at the law school in Andover. I hope you will join us in 2022 for the live version. It's an entertaining and informative family event providing education about animal law and advocacy, as well as fun family events including appearances by the Easter Bunny, Lucky the Law Dog, and Peter the Cat. We regret that personal safety issues precluded us from being together this year, but enjoy the show and plan to be with us next year on the day before Easter in Andover. So today, we bring you training tips, police dogs, animal liability advice, and animal legislation matters. Diane? Thanks, Mike. Senator Bruce Starr has been a leader in animal advocacy and has been the recipient of our humanitarian award on more than one occasion. Quite frankly, his work would merit him receiving this award each and every year. Senator Tarr is the minority leader of the Massachusetts Senate, where he has been a member since 1995. He is the sponsor of the Beagle Freedom Bill, which would provide for adoption of mostly beagles after lab research is over. Senator. Well, thanks, Diane, and I'm so honored to be with you once again for Animal Law Day, this way in a little bit different format. But it's so important that the Massachusetts School of Law carries on this tradition and helps us to remember all of our animal friends during the time of the pandemic, because they're such important parts of our lives. Now, I want to give you a brief update from Beacon Hill and let you know that the Massachusetts legislature is continuing on with a very long tradition of animal welfare laws. We've had so much support from you and all of the folks at Mass School of Law in the past for things like Pause 1 and Pause 2, which have been very successful pieces of legislation to protect animal welfare in Massachusetts. Now we're working on something special, and that relates to research animals. We've talked a little bit in the past about the fact that we are trying to now pass something called the Beagle Bill, and that's legislation which is intended to protect animals that are used in research. Now this idea is one that's been spreading across the country. In fact, 11 states have some form of research animal protection and adoption bills, and four more are considering them in this legislative session. Well, simply put, what these bills do is ensure that when an animal has given its time and made its sacrifice for research in laboratories that it has a right to be adopted. Why do we call it the Beagle Bill? Well, it's because many times beagles are used for this type of research because they are docile and they are friendly and they're willing to have things done to them in a laboratory. But according to the Pew Foundation in 2016, there were also cats and other animals used. In fact, there were about 80,000 of these animals that were used in that type of research. We also know how very important research is in Massachusetts, and I do want to point out that nothing in this bill is intended to stop medical research in Massachusetts. In fact, we've modified the bill to accommodate the concerns of the people that conduct that research and have made changes through the Joint Committee on Natural Resources and Agriculture. A very special thanks to Senator Gobi and Representative Pignatelli for working with us and bringing the parties together so that we could recognize the concerns of folks that do medical research as well as the advocates for our Beagle Bill. What's happened now is through the work of the committee, the bill has been amended to make sure that it's clear that an animal can be made and must be made available for adoption if it poses no threat to an adopting family. 
meaning it has no medical problems or psychological problems. Also clarifying that an adoption can be made through an individual. Oftentimes, researchers develop a relationship with the animal that they're working with, and we want to make sure that kind of adoption can happen as well. But most of all, we want to make sure that when an animal like a beagle, it's just such a friendly, caring animal, has completed its time doing research that could save our lives, that that animal gets a chance to be adopted and to have a more normal life than being euthanized or being restricted in some other way. And so what's happening right now with the bill is it's been reported from the Committee on Natural Resources and Agriculture. It is in the Senate Committee on Ways and Means, and we're hoping to move it through the committee and into the, onto the floor of the Senate and then to the floor of the House. Now, I also should point out that there are House versions of this legislation, and they've been sponsored by Representatives Dubois and Dykema, and their bills have been incorporated into the Senate bill, which again, we hope very soon to have reported from the Senate Committee on Ways and Means and have it go to the floor of the Senate and then to the floor of the House. This is a really important bill. And I will point out lastly that there's also federal legislation moving through the process that could well be enacted that would make this the law in all 50 states as opposed to having each state do it individually. But for right now, Massachusetts is once again showing its leadership and its concern about animal welfare with the Beagle Bill. And again, a very special thanks. I've thanked a number of people in elected office and in government, but also thanks to the Beagle Freedom Project for tremendous advocacy as we move forward to protect the animals that are helping to save our lives through their sacrifice in medical research. Thanks, Diane. Every year, the Middleton Sheriff's Department, a crowd favorite, puts on a demonstration to a full house here at Animal Rights Day. So what would this year's event be without them? Joining us now are Captain Cody, Sergeant Sousa, Officers Nash and Patton. So what the handler is doing now, he's gonna get his dog out of his, out of his uh, vehicle. He's gonna come over to search just the exterior of this vehicle. Uh, and, and again, it's all about routine with these dogs. So when this dog comes out of this guy, he's obviously being clicked to a certain collar, so he's going to kind of know what he's supposed to be doing. The handle is also going to sit him in a, per, in a certain spot on the vehicle, and he's also going to give him his verbal command of what to do. So the dog's going to know right off the bat exactly what we're doing, just from this same pattern. This is exactly how we train this dog, Patton, here, and his handle will always start at the right front headlight of a vehicle, and they do their initial sweep. So we'll watch him do that. He gives his command. And again, this is nice, a nice loose leash. He's not correcting the dog. He's going to let him find it on his own. Because if we can get it right away on his own, just kind of circling the car, that's great. And it looks like he might have something here. You're going to see, obviously, there's a change in behavior here. He's active. And then when you get to what we call a final response, is that sick. We'll hide on the uh, passenger side. Yes, and then, boom, the dog gets his reward. And he gets his reward with that towel. And the towel is used instead of a rough toy or a hard toy because it's soft. He can play tug of war. And the handler gets, in, gets to engage him with it and play with him with it. And that's all what this is about. Wow. We're making the dog happy. The dog recognizes the scent. And he knows, hey, if I sit when I recognize that scent, he's going to give me that towel. And this is what I really want. That's all he wants. This is this incredible. Once he's going to do it one more time just to have some fun out of it. Where is it? He shows him. He sits. He's literally pointing with his nose where the narcotics are. Now, how and long was he trained to do that? So he initially went to the uh, um, the seven-week academy, with the Boston uh, Police Narcotics Canine Academy, and it's seven weeks long. Um, but it doesn't just stop that. He went years ago to that. Once That's just the initial imprinting of it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that Scott and his, and his dog here go to training twice a month to keep him sharp. It is a, uh, it is a very... Um, it's a skill that the dog will lose. It's very perishable. So if we don't keep up with it and the dog's just going to suddenly not want to do it or he'll lose the drive to do it or he'll lose that scent because he hasn't had it in so long. So we send him two days a month. So he gets 16 hours a month and he goes to those training just to keep him sharp. Do they mostly use labs for this? No, no, no. My dog is a shepherd. And my dog will do the exact same thing that this dog just did. The reason we use the lab, and I, I should have explained this earlier, is that the lab, uh, it's a very passive dog. When he indicates, he sits. And my shepherd also sits, but the shepherd can, also has a lot of patrol training and a lot of aggression training in him, which is needed for the patrol work. But at the same time, uh, he sometimes will get bitey and scratchy at where the narcotics are. So we use the lab when we search people, there's no chance of any accidental scratching, any accidental biting. 
So we'll use the lab for when we search visitors or, or whoever he has um, lined up to do that day. So this is K9 Dash. He's a seven year old German Shepherd. He's been with the department since he's been about 11 months old. And uh, what we're gonna do today is I'm just gonna show you, demonstrate how the dog apprehends. And uh, apprehension is, is the, uh, the word we use when he actually goes ahead and he, and he latches on and bites on to the suspect. Now, we train him to do that in certain areas on the suspect. Generally, we train him to bite in the arms or in the legs. And the reason for that is that these are nice, thick parts of the body. We don't wanna cause too much damage to the suspect. We just want him to bite and hold. And you'll hear me say that a few other times. He bites and holds until we can come over, take the dog off, put the handcuffs on the suspect. And that's basically how this works. Um, one thing before we do this, I just want to be clear, is that uh, they're not these attack dogs that you think, the, the, the days of old when these dogs were literally attacking and attacking and biting people. That's not what these dogs do. That's not what you're trained to do, and that's definitely not what we want them to do. Um, like I said before, these dogs are trained to bite and hold and you're gonna see that they'll bite in this one particular area and they'll just hold right there they will not come off that bite they'll stay right on there the whole time until I come up and give him a command to take off or I come up and I verbally take him off so we'll go ahead up on the hill here and I'll have my decoy come around the other side and we'll show you how uh, Dash here apprehends somebody so if the suspect was hiding right there behind the behind the car I would call him out and we would go ahead from this point let me just switch him up okay hey suspect I see you over there come here let me see your hands right now. Come out from behind that car. Good boy, you watch him. Show me your hands. Stop right there. Don't run. Stay right there. Fucking get him. You're gonna see how he apprehends. Good boy. Now again, we're a team. Good dog. Yeah, good buddy. Yeah, that's a good dog. Good boy. That's a good dog. Yes, good boys, yes. Let me get his collar. Good dog, good boy. Good boy. Oh, seats, 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 foos. Good foos. Dash, foos. Mom. And you can see how we just bit that one spot and held. And you can see the aggression. This is something that you say, boy, he doesn't really have control. He really wants that. We really want to keep this in the dog. We never want him to be fearful. We really want to not curtail it so much, but we still want to have some type of control when it's over. If I were to correct him really hard and say, no, 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 forget it, we'd be like, hey, you were just training me all this time to do this. And now suddenly you don't want me to do it. So there's a fine balance between control and aggression. I have been teaching animal law for decades at the Massachusetts School of Law. The pervasive theme that resonates throughout my course American society's convenient classification of animals as property, worth nothing more than a piece of merchandise, and a low-priced one at that. Our legal system does not recognize the bond between people and their companions, a loving and trusted family member. It's no wonder that in this period of increased isolation, illness, and depression, the adoption of companion animals has soared. Through the years, I've received calls from distraught pet owners whose cherished pet has been killed as a result of the willful, wanton, reckless, or negligent act of another. The stories are heart-wrenching, and the pet owner has virtually no recourse, translating into the reality that their pet's life was worth nothing. Let's hear from Chris about his loss of Crawford and what he's trying to do about it. Thank you, Diane. The legislation I've been working on has been a component of what I found um, to be a little bit of a disparity in the law and the legal system. We've all been stuck in our houses for quite some time recently and we sit around our material possessions, but we also snuggle on the couch with our dog or our family members and sometimes the dog, the cat, is our family member. And right now the legal system is crafted in a way where our dog, our cat, um, as much of a bond as we share with them is still just treated as nothing more than personal property. So if something goes wrong with that care treatment or even a product that's produced in a $1.7 trillion industry, it still is only looked at as a piece of possession. Um, and the legislation is designed to change how a pet is looked at to give them more value, the same value that they bring to our family and our lives, um, is what the legislations aim to do. 
So it allows for when somebody makes mistakes, makes intentional errors, mistreats our animals in a way where they're harmed or, or killed, um, veterinary malpractice, dog food that should have been recalled, pet products that they knew were causing harm, or even a prescription drug that your veterinary gives to your dog that they know that there's severe and adverse side effects to that could cause issues um, and they don't do anything about it. So if there's no penalty, there's no risk for them to put themselves in a position of profit. Um, if something goes wrong, paying a couple hundred dollars to replace what they consider a possession isn't what we all value our pets to be. The reason why I, I have taken this on as a task and a, a kind of a duty and an obligation is um, several years ago my dog Crawford died as a result of an adverse reaction to a drug that I should have been given proper warning on that the drug manufacturer should probably have never continued to allow to be sold on the market and yet it is today. I lost a good friend. I lost a family member. Um, I was going through cancer treatment and Crawford was the was the one thing that I could go to, person, dog, animal, pet, um, and talk to without him feeling down as a result of what I was saying to him. As much as I brought my concerns about what that drug was doing, it was ignored, it was minimized, and as a result, um, he, he died. I, I had to make that ultimate decision with him because he was at a point where the drug's adverse side effects had caused too much damage that couldn't be repaired, couldn't be turned back, and I, I lost a family member from something that shouldn't have happened. If I was given the proper tools and the proper way of seeking justice um, against a big company for their producing this drug and allowing it to still be out there with pets, I would have taken that course of action, um, but it wasn't available to me. The legislation I've been working on would let them see that there's a penalty, there's a way for people to get justice for their loss, justice for their suffering. What's happened in this pet industry is they make $1.7 trillion a year and they have zero to little liability for anything they do wrong. And I wanted justice for what happened to Crawford. There's no system in place. I tried to do the best I could, and I think what I can do now is help others. As a result of doing this over the last five to six years, I've had people reach out to me, people that have had similar experiences where they've lost their dog while it's been staying at a kennel. They've had a pet that's died as a result of something to do with veterinary care. They've had a dog that's been injured as a result of pet food that wasn't recalled even though the company knew about the issue. This industry isn't working quick enough to take the liability factor into it and they've got such little liability that they're willing to take that risk for the profit. If they knew just a little bit about what it meant for us but they don't have the consequences when they make mistakes. Don't forget to reach out to your senators and representatives for their support on this soon-to-be proposed animal legislation. Just like the police dogs, Kimberly Palermo, owner of Blue Dog, which provides dog walking services, training, and more, has been a regular at Animal Law Day, demonstrating clicker training and much more. So here's Kim and Fern demonstrating a few dog techniques you can do at home. Hi, I'm Kim and I'm the owner of Blue Dog. We offer dog training to Andover and the surrounding area. I'm here with my 13 week old golden retriever puppy Fern and she's here to help me demonstrate a behavior you can teach your dog at home that's helpful and fun and very useful in a lot of ways. Um, but, but before we get to that, I just wanna talk a little bit about how we do training here at Blue Dog. So we use positive reinforcement which means we teach our dogs or we reward our dogs for doing the right thing by giving them treats rather than waiting for them to make a mistake and then correcting them. 
Um, so Fern here is lying on her bed next to me very nicely. So I'm using treats to let her know that this is what I'd like her to do. And you can also probably hear me making the sound. This is a clicker. So we use marker training and the clicker is telling her that behavior of lying next to me is what's going to get you a treat. So every time I click, she then gets a treat. Now, if you don't have a clicker at home, you can simply use the word yes instead. So I can say yes and give Fern a treat. So that behavior I wanted to teach you, we're going to teach your dog to target your hand with their nose. So the reason why we do this is I like to use it a lot for my dogs to teach them to come when called. So I can have my dog far away and I can say Fern touch and she comes running over to me to touch my hand. Um, this is also a good way to get my dog on and um, off of furniture or I can keep their attention. If they're distracted by another dog, I can say puppy touch. Now I've got my dog facing me. So it's a really useful tool. So the way we're gonna teach this is we're gonna start with a cookie under our thumb and a flat hand. I'm gonna put my hand directly in front of my dog or my puppy's nose. As soon as I feel that little nose on my hand, I'm gonna click and then give them the treat. So it looks like this. Good girl. So I'm gonna do that three times with that cookie under my thumb. And I can also use the word yes instead of the click. Yes. The fourth time I'm gonna do an empty hand. As soon as I feel that nose on my hand, I'm going to click and then pull the treat out. So she still gets a treat, but it doesn't come until after she does the behavior. So this is a great thing to teach your dog at home. Like I said, it can teach them to come when called, it can get them off the furniture, it can get their attention onto you when you need them to. I have another behavior that you can teach your dog at home, and this is gonna really help to keep, keep your dog's attention. Um, it's also gonna help if you have a dog who pulls on the leash or gets distracted out on walks. So this game is called the one, two, three game. It's super simple and fun for your dog. Um, and it's a great way to get them to be focused on you. So the way this game is gonna work is I'm gonna count out loud to three. When I say the number three, Fern here gets a treat. Easy as that. So it goes one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Super simple, right? What eventually happens is I start counting one, two, three. See how Fern looked up for that cookie. So it's a good way to get her attention. Now I can use this when I'm out for a walk. I can start counting to three and at the number three she's going to look up for that cookie but even at the number one or two I'm going to get her attention. Um, this also works well if you have a dog who doesn't want to come into the house. Go outside, start counting to three, and they're gonna gladly come in with you. Um, so there's a lot of great uses, and it's super easy. You don't even need a clicker at home to play this game. So again, that's the one, two, three game. One, two, three, and your dog gets a treat. Thank you so much for watching. We need to take a break, so please stay with us for more of our remote animal logic. From day one, I knew I took the right step. The Massachusetts School of Law is challenging, but you feel welcomed and supported at every turn. You're learning the professional skills you need to get hired. From professors with real world experience. Trust me, that makes a huge difference. I now have a job I love, and the best part is, I'm not in debt. No LSAT is required. Teachers that make a difference at the most affordable law school in New England, the Massachusetts School of Law. Your future starts here. When I first saw Turtle, my heart was full. Not anything but lonely. We had this like deep connection, this heart connection. He just wants to be close to you and part of your life. Every day with Turtle is a perfect day. When I'm holding her, it makes me feel calmer. I think everything he does shows how much he loves us. When we adopt a shelter pet, we discover they're a little bit of a lot of things. But they're all pure, pure love. 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 Welcome back. 
Professor Martin has been teaching at the Massachusetts School of Law for over 30 years. He is an expert on tort liability and will now share with you the law and tell you what you need to know about liability if you're bit by a dog or your dog nips somebody. I teach torts. Torts is the body of law about compensation for injuries to persons and property. Animal law goes back a thousand years to a time when human beings lived more intimately with animals than they now do. The law on the subject also goes back a thousand years and in particular laws about injuries inflicted by animals are not based on the negligence of the owner or harborer. Three terms I'd like you to keep in mind for this discussion. Uh, one is negligence. Negligence is defined, as I teach my tort students, as failure to take reasonable care, which may lead to liability for an award of damages. Second term is strict liability. That means you are liable for the damages no matter how much care you took. And finally, the word statute. Statutes are passed by the legislature, may change the common law, and in the case of dogs in Massachusetts, as I'll get to, did so. Now, animals differ from human beings. They don't have bank accounts, uh, and they can't write checks. Uh, however, human beings may be in a relationship with animals uh, such that they can be compelled to write the check when the animal does injure persons or property. Uh, the law on this subject is divided into two categories of animals, wild animals and domesticated animals. Uh, wild animals in the wild state uh, are not owned by anybody and there is nobody therefore to pay compensation. If you get mauled by a bear in Yellowstone National Park, uh, you will be uh, on the hook for all the costs uh, uh, inflicted by uh, the bear. Wild animals in captivity present a different problem. It's no longer a common practice in uh, Massachusetts at least to find wild animals kept in captivity, but it still occurs and every now and then a case of an injury by a wild animal kept in captivity does, uh, does surface. And the law on that subject is that you are liable for the injury inflicted by a wild animal kept in captivity no matter how careful you were to keep the animal restrained. Once again, the distinction is by species. Lions and tigers and bears are wild animals. Ferrets and monkeys and alligators are wild animals. The elephant is a jurisprudential curiosity because it is uh, considered a wild animal in Africa, but a domesticated species in uh, India, Thailand, and Burma. And look around you at the Massachusetts School of Law. You will see wild turkeys, and they are uh, w wild, and if you are injured by one of the wild turkeys, you cannot look to the Massachusetts School of Law for compensation. Other category of animals is domesticated animals, and once again, the distinction is by species. Uh, pets, dogs, and cats are domesticated animals. Livestock, cows, pigs, sheep, goats, turkeys, uh, Thanksgiving turkeys are domesticated species, and beasts of burden like horses, mules, and oxen are domesticated species. And the rule of liability is that the owner or harborer of a domestic animal is liable for injuries inflicted by the animal only if the animal is of a, quote, vicious propensity those words have been in the law for centuries. And this is known to the defendant, owner, or harborer. Uh, and if that knowledge exists on the part of the owner or harborer, then the owner or harborer is strictly liable. Uh, the crunch point in cases is usually whether the owner or harborer had prior notice of the animal's vicious propensity. 
And who is in the best position to know that? Obviously the owner or harborer. And who is in the best position to lie about it? Also the owner or harborer. And this rule was known as the one bite rule. Every dog gets one bite. And in the case of dogs and dogs only, the Massachusetts legislature passed a statute. It's chapter 140, section 155 of the general laws, which provides that the owner or harborer of a dog is strictly liable for injuries to persons and property uh, committed by the dog. I would emphasize that this is a statute about dogs only. However, the uh, vast majority, almost all of the cases of injuries uh, inflicted by animals which have been recorded in the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court or the Appeals Court in the last 50 years have involved injuries by dogs. So dog owners, remember, you are liable for injuries or damage inflicted by your dog regardless how careful you have been to restrain the animal uh, from, from uh, inflicting such injuries or damage. And with that, good news, I wish you a good day. Eric Vose is the owner and head trainer of Insight Dog Training. He joins us with some tips on what to look for when adopting a dog and what to do about some common behavior problems. So definitely want to do as much research as you can about breed um, and, the, and the rescue that you're planning on working with. Um, there's a lot of good rescues out there. Don't just go by uh, online reviews alone. Some people that don't get a dog that they want, they can go online and leave a bad review. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad rescue organization. When you go in, have an open mind. Uh, talk to the people about what you want in a dog and let them kind of try to guide you to a dog. Um, you're going to end up with a lot less friction when you bring your dog home if you do it that way. Um, than you would if you went in based on solely on looks. The people that work there, they know the dogs really well. They love the dogs um, and they want to find a match for that dog just as much as you want to find a match for your family. Any different advice if one is contemplating purchasing a dog from a dog breeder? Basic thing you want to look for in a breeder or anywhere that you're getting a dog is you want the people that are taking care of the dog to care about the dog. You don't want them to treat it like a product. Um, you want them to care who gets their dog. You want them to care about the health of their dog, that they breed for, for, health, uh, for health reasons, for temperament reasons. Um, everybody wants that you know, perfect looking dog, but that's not gonna help it uh, once it gets into your house, into your family. There's no dog more beautiful than Apollo, and oh my goodness, <laughs> I say you're lucky that you're pretty. That's how we got you. <laughs> let's talk about behavior problems. So let's start with day one, you bring the dog home and he chews up the house. And you have to be careful because extension cords could kill the dog. So what advice do you have for folks in the audience with that type of problem? So the best thing you can do before you bring your dog home Pretend like you're going to have a really mobile toddler coming into your house. <laughs> They'll find things you didn't even know existed in your house and they will, uh, and they'll start to just explore it. That's all they're doing is exploring. They don't mean anything malicious, um, but they can get into trouble. Okay, what about problems with housebreaking? People who bring in a very young puppy, um, or maybe they even take in an older dog that hasn't been housebroken. Do you have any advice there? So every time you bring in a new dog, assume that you're gonna have to start from the beginning with housebreaking. Even in a, moving to a new environment, they don't know how to ask to go to the bathroom yet if it's an older dog. Younger dogs, they've never had to ask. Their mom has taken care of that the whole time that they've been a puppy. Consistency is the key. Um, take them out the same door. Take them out as often as you can. The general rule of thumb is that a dog can hold, can hold it maximum for as many, uh, as many hours as they are months old. So if they're two months old, two hours maximum. Um, and nobody's perfect. There's gonna be an accident. 
if there's an accident, unless you see it happen, there's nothing you can do about it. Your dog forgot about that as soon as it happened. Um, you just have to clean it up and go about your day. If you see it happening, scoop them up, bring them right outside, give them lots of rewards for going to the bathroom outside. I'm a vegetarian and I've got a prey driven dog. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think anyone can predict what dogs are going to be prey driven, at least not to the degree Apollo is. What advice do you have there? So the best thing you can do in that situation is really work on your fundamentals training, your basic training commands, your sits, your stays, that kind of thing. Um, that will give you more control. And then try to fulfill that drive somehow in a productive way. Um, you can use what's called a flirt pole. Um, that'll get them going. Uh, fetch, frisbee, those kinds of things can help work that prey drive. As they're fulfilled, the, that's gonna make it easier for you to control them in that situation. If they don't feel like they need to take that opportunity to cash in. How about over the top barking, growling, those type of behavior problems? Any advice there? With like jumping and barking, growling, nipping, all those kinds of things. Yep. Um, the, a lot of the products you see that come out, um, depending on the product, they can be helpful. It's kind of a band-aid. It's going to help stop them immediately, uh, a lot of them, but it's not going to change their whole mindset. Um, it's the emotion behind it that we want to work with. Uh, we want to change their reaction to the situation, not so much just change um, the symptom. We want them to think, uh, you know, if they see a person instead of barking and growling because they're scared, if we, if we introduce that person and desensitize them to strange people, they'll become happier. The barking and growling will start to fade away on its own and you'll have a much happier dog. Eric, what is your overarching philosophy, if you will, on owning a dog and dog training? If you are honest with yourself and you understand what makes you happy and fulfilled in your life and you work to figure out what makes your dog happy and fulfilled in its life, combining those two things together will create the foundation for a really strong relationship. Another regular at Animal Rights Day is attorney Jeremy Cohen of Boston Law Dogs. Today, he discusses pet custody issues and gives advice on animal matters he frequently gets calls about. Jeremy? Thanks, Diane. It's great to be here for Animal Rights Day. And part of what I wanted to talk about today is, is the disjointedness between how we as pet owners feel about our pets versus how the law, at least in Massachusetts and in most states in this country, look at our pets. An example of that is through pet custody cases. So we'll get calls from, from young people who decide to move in together and split up after getting a pet or married people who want to get divorced. And right now the law wants us to look at who has title to that animal, who's the one that purchased it, whose name is on the sales receipt. But at Boston Dog Lawyers, we're saying that is not nearly enough to prove who owns the dog or who should get the dog. We often believe that both people in a relationship have rights to the dog, uh, possessory rights, and it's not just that snapshot in time when you purchased the animal or adopted the animal. It's what's happened since then. And it's not just about money, it's about time and bonding and walking the dog and taking the dog to the vet and uh, who, who does the dog sleep with. I mean, I'm not saying that we should look at, at we can't ask the dog, but there's ways, indicators now where I think courts need to start looking at what's in the best interest of the animal. So we've seen in states like Alaska, Illinois, California, New York, they're starting to look at what's in the best interest of all involved. Because the owners uh, often will times will say, I can't live without this dog, it's my support animal, my service dog, but let's look at what's happening with the dog. So I want to know who has the better yard who works 60 hours a week and who or who's home more. Financial ability is certainly something that's important. Are there other pets? Splitting up pets is not, it's not good for the pets. And sometimes if there's two animals, courts love to just say, well, you take one and you take one, but that's really not considering the impact that it has on the cats or on the dogs. There's certainly cases where one party brings the animal into the relationship. 
But what we want to look at, getting away from that snapshot in time, let's look at over the last few years, who and when did something change? So in a lot of relationships, there's a when. There's a point in time where this dog became somebody else's, where the girlfriend took over or the boyfriend suddenly took over more of the care of the dog. So we want to get away from just who brought it into the relationship. For instance, we had a case where uh, the, the husband, ex-husband now, had sent his wife and the dog ahead uh, to, to scope out a place to live for two months in advance. And it was during that time that she and the dog bonded. So to say that it was always going to be his dog because he's the one who brought it into the relationship is just not true. And we are compelling courts now to look at in terms of who would be the better owner is there abuse involved? We now know that courts are, are tying together harassment prevention orders where if somebody was abusing a person, they want to protect the animal too. There's hundreds of indicia of ownership or at least possessory rights to your pets. And it's different in every case, but we are, we're seeing laws change. Unfortunately, not so much in Massachusetts yet. We need our legislators to step up and recognize the way these other states are ha, have been, that these these pets are more than property. They 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 have a special purpose, and I'm not advocating right now that uh, you they have to go right from being a piece of property to have full rights and standing. I'm not saying that, but they certainly have interests that need to be considered beyond just what the owners have paid for or are or are arguing makes them the owner. For instance, uh, in in probate court, in family court right now, when we, when we take a case there, judges do not want to handle anything related to the pets. And we see that even though the pets are such an emotional component of that relationship and people are so keyed in on what's going to happen to them, the judges in family court, they push it off. And it's, it's just overlooked. And we see that the judges will allow us to come to agreements outside of the court. So we often draft joint custody agreements and yes joint custody agreements can happen there's in a joint custody agreement we consider here's what's happening Here, here's all the needs of the dog to think about and we go we go from everywhere from making sure the dog or cat eats the same food wherever it goes versus uh, has the same veterinary care uh, who's caring for it financially what about if one of the owners uh, predeceases the pet then what happens or what to do when there's an emergency medical situation with the pet so we're drafting these agreements almost as if they they dovetail into a pet trust as to let's make the courts enforce what's best for the animal and it's it's concerning to me that a lot of people don't know that they have rights to shear an animal or oftentimes one partner is bullied by the other into believing if they if they try to pursue it, they'll lose all custody rights. And I had a lawyer call me last week who was concerned that she was going to have to stay in a relationship until her dog died because she didn't want to have to lose her dog. And that is so sad and not true because you have ownership rights. You may not have full ownership rights, but we're getting courts to recognize that shared custody is an option. In, you know, in terms of talking about what's in the best interest of our animals, our pets, I do want to give some pet owners uh, a few other tips aside from just custody cases. If you are going to board a dog, please know that boarding facilities are not regulated. I take it upon myself as part of Boston Dog Lawyers that we are the regulating entity right now. I see too many cases where they trust a boarding facility that there's staff overnight. Make sure there's going to be staff there overnight. Make sure they're going to have a functioning air conditioner or heating system. Make sure that they're going to keep, even daycare, small dogs away from big dogs. Are they temperament testing before? Because too many animals are getting, are dying at daycare and boarding facilities because of, of just simple things that could be fixed, keeping the animals separate. Do they have a protocol for uh, breaking up a dog fight? Do they have a, a fire emergency plan? If nobody's going to be there overnight, What's the, who's, who's watching out for the dogs in case of an emergency like that? I'm seeing too many cases come to us uh, about that issue. And oftentimes the defense is, look, there's no regulation, so we really don't have to have a protocol. And 
that's not fair. That's not right for us pet owners. Uh, and last thing to, to cover today is, is working with your veterinarian. Being a vet is a very difficult job. We get a call or two a day about somebody saying the vet harmed my animal. But it's really not true. What happens is vets are conditioned now. If something goes wrong and a pet owner has a dispute or a grievance, they're conditioned to not to turn their back. Insurance companies tell them, do not talk to the, pay, to the client anymore. And then people come to me because they haven't been heard and they don't know what happened to their animal. If you could engage your vet more and say, I'm not looking to sue you. I'm just looking for information so I know, did I do something wrong? Did I, uh, did I come to the wrong place? Did I not seek out a specialist? Too many people, pets, pet owners, when something happens, they get this pet ownership guilt. And if you could get your, pet, your vet to talk to you about your pet more, uh, I think that disputes would be quelled. You, you need information, and when pet owners don't have that information is when they come to us. And it's often not the case that the vet committed malpractice, but you won't know that because you're not hearing the information you want to hear from your vet. So ask them to speak to you more. Let them know you're not necessarily trying to sue them. You just want information. Uh, that's, that's it for me today. We have uh, other tips for pet owners uh, every day of the year at Boston Dog Lawyers, and we're always happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Next is Christine Hawes, owner of Hawes Mediation and Consulting. Christine is a graduate of the Massachusetts School of Law. On today's program, Christine will provide tips on bringing your newborn into your home of animals. Christine? Thanks, Diane. I'm here to talk to you today about bringing a new baby into your home when you have dogs that are already living there. We had to deal with this situation, which wasn't a situation, it was a blessing, um, but we have four dogs, three of which are guardian breed Cane Corsos and a senior miniature pincher. When you love your dog so much, you don't want to ever put them in a position that they're going to be uncomfortable in their home either. So that's where we had to start brainstorming how we're going to make the situation work in our home so that everyone's comfortable, everyone's still getting all the attention that they need, and that our son Anthony was going to continue to thrive as he grows in a house full of dogs. First and foremost, you're going to find out you're pregnant. The one thing that you should do if you do not have a trusted trainer is hire a trainer. Hire a trainer that has the credentials of introducing baby to dogs and dogs to baby. This isn't going to be a trainer that's going to just teach your dog sit and stay and place. This is going to be a trainer that actually understands that this is a new emotional situation for everyone in the household. And this is also a situation that can be strenuous on a dog who just doesn't understand. We use Danielle Duffin. She has been my trainer. Judge is going to be seven. So she has been my trainer for seven years. Uh, the only other trainer that I have personally worked with that I know has the credentials to bring the baby into the home and make your dogs comfortable and give you a plan is Steve Roberts at Canine Top Performance. Once you get a trainer, you want to get a game plan in place. And this game plan is going to consist of making sure that if your dog doesn't have the obedience that they have, getting that beat obedience down in place before the baby arrives, and also the plan of how you're going to structure your home. There shouldn't be a free-for-all in your home. We have a gate system in our house, and that's so every dog and baby has their own space that they're comfortable in. So if they get overwhelmed, that they have a place that they can go and relax and that they can just decompress because babies scream and babies cry and they make new noises, they have new smells, your dog's not gonna be used to that. So you want a plan that's gonna make them comfortable. Once you have that plan prior to your baby arriving, your bundle of joy is gonna arrive and you're gonna, hopefully you'll have that opportunity to bring something from the hospital home that's gonna smell like them. Uh, Anthony was in the NICU for almost a month, so we had scents coming home every single day that we could bring to the dogs. The dogs were smelling me, they were smelling his father. Uh, we brought blankets home. The NICU nurses were fantastic to make sure that we always had something to bring home to the dogs. With that said, one of the main concerns when I spoke to healthcare professionals when he was in the NICU was how many nurses saw horror shows of people not preparing their dogs properly, not introducing their dogs properly to the baby, and first and foremost, not setting boundaries for their child with the dogs. I was lucky enough to work in rescue for a long time, and I still do work in rescue um, with 
various rescues and uh, people that need to surrender. And one of the largest reasons for owner surrender is because they have a new baby and the dog's just not adjusting and they just don't think it's fair to the dog. And that's really the purpose of coming up with a plan with your trainer is making sure that your dog isn't neglected, that you have time for your dog, um, because just because you have a baby in the home, you still have this being, this living being that was there first and needs that attention that they always had. So there's really no difference, except you have another addition in the home and everyone should remain to have that balance in the home. And the importance of having that balance is your dog's not gonna get jealous, they're not gonna get depressed, uh, they'll keep up with and maintain the training that they had. Um, so as long as you have that plan and that balance and everyone is getting the attention that they need, you should be able to have a smooth transition in the household. So now, smell, plan, we have all of that aligned, baby comes home. Don't ever just let your dog run up to the baby to greet them. Just like bringing a new dog into the home, which we always have to tell people um, in rescue or people that, you know, in training that are bringing new puppies in the home, any interactions and new interactions needs to be done on a leash. Have your dog on a leash um, if you want them to you know, go up to the carrier, put them in a sit-stay. Make sure it's a 100% controlled environment. You are bringing this little peanut home, which might be under 10 pounds. He was only five pounds when I brought him home. And you have a dog, whether it's a big dog or a little dog, it's still a dog. Um, so they're not gonna be used to the situation and how dogs react to things aren't like how humans react to things. So you just wanna make sure it's a controlled environment. And as I said, baby's home, now baby's gonna grow and things are gonna change. And you wanna make sure that any new interaction that you have to put your dog through is in a controlled environment, that your dog is comfortable in that environment. And I know we love our animals so much that we think that they think like us, but we can't give them that disrespect. They are dogs and they have a different way of thinking and they have a different way of reacting to new things. And if you don't give them the respect that is due to them as our companion to understand them and to make them comfortable, you're, you're doing your dog a disservice. And you know, they aren't a disposable being. You brought an animal into your home to love forever. That's why we call it a forever home. That's why we call them our companions. You just don't throw them out. And just a little personal situation of what we do every single night is Anthony's father will, yeah, you, Anthony's father will put him to bed every night. And that is my time to work and train the dogs. I take them for walks every night. I do training with them. And if there is a day or an evening that I have clients and I can't, you know, I know I'm not going to be able to walk them at night. We will work with them in our side yard, which is why our yard is sent. As a baby grows and things start to change, you're going to want to continue to have plans and work with a trainer. Um, and hopefully, you know, everything goes well. And if it doesn't, you work with a plan in the home that will still be able to give these guys a long life with you and these guys a safe life with these ones. Um, and remember, it's not about that you don't trust your dog, it's that you love them too much to let anything happen to them too. Thank you. Shiloh said, there are just no words to ever express a heartfelt thanks to you and your organization for saving our baby girl. Our life revolves around her and we shudder to think we were so close to putting her down because no one would help. Please thank all who played a part on her behalf. Thank you so much for helping us help our puppy, said Naya. And Milo said, thank you so very much for all you have done to take the pressure off my heart. I will be forever indebted to you and your cause. For 15 years, the Shadow Fund has been helping provide financial assistance to a guardian of an animal who is unable to provide necessary veterinarian care or medical attention for a cherished pet. In order to do so, with the support and encouragement of the Massachusetts School of Law, the Shadow Fund has held its annual fundraising event, Animal Rights Day. Every year since 2006, we gather at the Massachusetts School of Law at Andover in the spring for a family and friends fun-filled day, which includes appearances by the Easter Bunny, Lucky the Law Dog, and Peter the Cat. 
Our goal each year is to spread awareness of pressing animal law issues in animal legislation. Our events include live animal demonstrations from various agencies, animal rights discussion sessions, children's crafts, and so much more. This event, which is free and open to the public, has been the Shadow Fund's main fundraising event. Unfortunately, our 14th annual Animal Rights Day was postponed and ultimately canceled due to the 2020 public health emergency caused by COVID-19. And as the global pandemic presses on, we will not be able to safely hold our Animal Rights Day in person this year either. This unprecedented global pandemic has caused such a disruption in our lives. Many have lost their jobs, people forced to work from home, schools have shut down, and children learning remotely through online instruction and homeschooling. Social gatherings have halted or decreased, and our daily interactions have been reduced to virtual meetings. Our annual Animal Rights Day 2021 is also coming to you virtually this year. And while we must wait until it's safe to hold our event in person again, necessary medical care for beloved pets is not as patient. The requests for assistance are ever present and the pandemic has caused an increased need. There are several ways for you to help us help those in need of financial assistance for necessary veterinary care. You can visit our website, www.shadowfundne.org to make a donation. You may also send your donations directly to the Shadow Fund at the Massachusetts School of Law, 500 Federal Street in Andover, Massachusetts. You may also purchase one or more of our books. All proceeds from the sale of these books go directly to the Shadow Fund. The first book, Please Can We Keep the Donkey? This book contains a collection of animal adoption and rescue stories from the Massachusetts School of Law community. And while the regular price is $19.99, we have an event special offering the book for $5. Our second book, I Rescued Two Dogs, Now Who Will Rescue Me? This price is $20. It is a daily account of the trial and tribulations of our founder, Diane M. Sullivan, after rescuing two monster chow chows and the wonderful way they destroyed her home on a daily basis. It's all true. We included the pictures to prove it. Our third book, Life's Not Always a Day at the Beach, is also $20. This book is an autobiography of our founder, Diane M. Sullivan, who documented and recounted her battle with an incurable illness. Her brave battle, which continues to this day, will undoubtedly inspire anyone fighting visible or invisible battles. You may purchase all three books for $40 plus the cost of shipping, and 100% of the proceeds from the sale of these books benefit the Shadow Fund. Your continued support is greatly appreciated. Without it, we could not help these animals in need. From all of us at the Shadow Fund, we hope you enjoyed this virtual event and we cannot wait to see you in person at our next Animal Rights Day. Be well and stay safe.